Hello, Congresswoman Finkenauer. Thank you for joining me. This is another in our series of video conversations with our greatest biofuels champions. So thank you for joining me. And I want to say at the outset that you have been such a phenomenally vocal and impactful champion. I thank you. I thank you. So we're just going to have a, a casual conversation. And I want to start out by asking you, why, is, why are biofuels so important for your constituents and for Iowans? I am somebody who grew up in Iowa in a small town in Iowa in Cheryl, which is, um, I, as I like to say, has more cows than people, surrounded by cornfields. And, um, you know, the importance of biofuels just really goes back to our communities here in Iowa. Um, when our producers and so our farmers are doing well, and then our biofuels producers are doing well, that also means the folks in our cities are doing well. Um, and we make John Deere tractors in Iowa one. And if our farmers are hurting, our producers are hurting, um, that also means manufacturing is hurting. And those are also really good paying jobs. So everything in my district is just so tightly connected it. And it's something that, again, you know, you, you just, to be an advocate for um, places in the Midwest, so not just Iowa, but if you're looking at other states as well surrounding, um, you better be a champion of biofuels. And you better be doing all you can to make sure um, that whoever is in the administration is hearing from you. And so um, that's really the, the big, you know, the biggest thing for me is just making sure that um, folks in DC who may not be as familiar are understanding what's actually happening on the ground and how everything is interconnected. Um, it's also important, obviously, for our environment as well. Um, you've got a lot of different states now passing different regulations having to do um, with greenhouse gas emissions, you name it, and so many now are looking to biofuels to be able um, to meet those standards. And so being able to uplift that as well and explain that to other folks that biofuels are an option, it's, you know, Know, it, it's it's one of those issues that I you know continue to just get excited to work on and also get excited to work across the aisle on um, again it's not necessarily Democratic or Republican it's more regional and it, we're trying to expand that reach too to make sure that folks besides just those in the Midwest understand why this is important so since you were elected and came into office in 2018 I mean literally day one you hit the ground running holding this administration accountable for their extensive abuse of the small refinery exemptions. Uh, talk to me a little bit about why fixing small refinery exemptions is so important for Iowa farmers and for biofuel producers. I knew what this was going to mean for my friends, family, and my neighbors. I mean, my brother-in-law and my sister are corn and soybean farmers. Um, they've got two little guys, and I know this firsthand about what um, again, when you go after renewable fuels, what that means to the bottom line of our farmers, of our producers. And, um, you know, again, it's just very disappointing to see we keep uplifting these stories and uplifting these voices and trying to tell the administration, you know, stop taking advantage of our producers because you favor big oil. Because at the end of the day, here's the other thing. Our folks aren't just hurting, um, you know, there, there's, there's the attacks on renewable fuels, but there's also the ongoing trade war, you know, uncertainty in markets. This is not the time to, con first of all, it's never the time, but this is especially not the time to be going after um, our producers and our farmers in this way that could be prevented. And so we'll just, we're going to continue to uplift the voices, but it is, um, it, it's definitely been an uphill battle with this administration, but we're going to continue to hold them accountable as much as we can and find all ways we can. Again, working across the aisle, working with the Senate, it doesn't matter. I've always said this. I don't care who you are, um, Democrat, Republican, um, if we can work together and it's going to help my state, help my community, I'm there. And right now, we just have to continue to find ways to do that and see if the administration listens or not. You continue to be a very strong proponent for expanding biofuels infrastructure. Talk to me about why that's so impactful for Iowa farmers and ethanol producers and retailers. Yeah, no, um, that's huge, obviously, because uh, we can support the industry, but if we don't have the capability to get, uh, obviously, the, the infrastructure out there at the, at the pump um, for our, our users, what, what are we doing, right? So that is another big part of making sure that we can expand access. Um, and again, talking about states who do have different regulations now of cutting down on emissions, that type of stuff, 
Well, a big part of that is investing in biofuels infrastructure to make sure that um, E15 is available, to make sure that we can expand this, and, and also the availability of E15, just to name one thing, right? Um, there's so many different things we can be doing, and this is also something I've been fighting for on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, because if we're going to be smart and making those investments, we should also make sure that our biofuel um, producers are able to actually get some of those investments and expand access into our um, our fueling pump infrastructure to begin with. So looking ahead a little bit as we as a country start to move toward hopefully soon a recovery mode from the impacts of COVID, what are some of the other priorities that are top of mind for you for biofuels producers but also just for rural America at large? Yeah well I'll tell you we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I, I came to Washington partly because I really felt that my friends, my family, and my neighbors hadn't been heard in DC, um, that their voices weren't being heard, that their stories weren't being told. And the thing that um, we need to remember, especially as we talk about moving through a pandemic and how do we stimulate the economy, how do we make sure folks can get back up on their feet, is that our agricultural community, our producers, have really, were really being hit very hard before this pandemic ever hit. So uh, that's something that we can't get lost in this either, that there was still more work to be done before this, and now there's even compounded um, work that needs to be done, whether it's making sure that they're not being undermined anymore. Um, I mean, we've got the those 52 stopgap waivers that are sitting out there, and so that's the first thing. It's just trying to stop the bleeding here, trying to stop the hits coming that don't need to be. Um, and then on top of it, it's making sure that when we are looking at, for example, the CARES Act, right? So we were able to allocate dollars to help industries, to help um, our, our small businesses, to help families. But at the end of the day, we allocate these dollars, they go to different agencies, and then these agencies decide where they go and who applies for them, that type of thing. And one of the things that we were really concerned about when we first allocated those CARES dollars, USDA decided to cut out biofuels um, from those dollars. That was never the intention from our legislative perspective, but that's what they did within the agency. So my job is going to continue to be as we move through this, as we look to, um, you know, again, get the aid to where it needs to be, is playing oversight here and making sure that these agencies are doing what they should and getting these dollars out to the folks who need them the most. Um, and then uh, on the infrastructure side of things, one of the best ways to stimulate an economy to help different um, industries is investing in infrastructure, helping rural areas. And what we just passed in the House is quite literally one of the best investments in rural infrastructure that literally has ever come out of Washington, D.C. Um, over $500 billion would be available for districts like mine. And when you can do that, that helps um, the entire community. And obviously, our biofuels producers uh, are a big part of that. Uh, and some of the better jobs in our rural areas are created um, in, in our ethanol plants, for example. And um, if we don't continue to have their backs and if this administration doesn't get the memo that we can't leave folks behind, um, I'm very worried about what we're gonna see. In a few short months, we are gonna host our annual Biofuel Summit in September in Washington, DC. And you will have a virtual Zoom conversation with, with many of our members. Tell me why it is so important for you to hear directly from our members, from our supporters, from your constituents on all things biofuels related. Yeah, so for me, one of the best ways to try to make change in any legislative space is it's not necessarily the numbers. It's not necessarily the graphs or the fancy reports you can hand people or anything like that. It's the stories. It's about how does this policy actually impact people sitting around their kitchen table in your district. And when you guys at Growth Energy brings folks, when I hear from folks, even from the Farm Bureau, for example, they come to visit and bring folks, hearing these stories about what's actually happening and then taking those stories to my colleagues or to the White House liaisons in this administration and saying, please stop ignoring what's happening, um, that is so impactful. And that's what I'll continue to do. I mean, I remember having somebody sitting in my office talking about dipping into their 401 
401k, he's lucky enough to have one. Um, another person, you know, or one of the women I had actually come testify was a sixth generation farmer who had three sons telling them not to go into farming because she was worried about their future and all the uncertainty out there, whether it was um, in the renewable fuel space or whether it was in the trade space. And these are the types of things that we continue to uplift. And we've got folks, you know, filing for bankruptcy. And I just do not want Washington or this administration to ever stop hearing about what is happening on the ground, what those conversations around kitchen tables are like. And um, you guys doing that work, bringing those stories to us, you have no idea how impactful that is. And then it is it's just so useful for us to be able to continue to spread those stories to as many people as possible. Well, I said this at the outset, I'll say it again. You, have, you remain just such an impactful champion for us. At every inflection point these past years for biofuels, you've been there working across the aisle, making sure that our interests are not partisan, uh, and many times being the tip of the spear for us, whether it's growing market access or, or defending the ground that we have and making sure we aren't further eroding the renewable fuel standard. Congresswoman, thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you again virtually in September with many of my members alongside and have a good rest of the day. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Emily. And thank you to all those at Growth Energy. And hopefully one of these days we all get to see each other in person soon. So thank you.